Hello, I'm Professor Busseya Booth. Thank you for joining me in this employment law learning session. We will be covering sexual orientation and gender identity discrimination. Let's go ahead and get started. In this session, we will go over important definitions. We will also discuss what the federal law allows, as well as how the EEOC, or the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, interprets and enforces the law. We'll also go over Washington State anti-discriminatory laws on the subject and end with management tips and considerations. We have three primary objectives for the rest of our time, today. one of which is to understand what the law allows with regard to workplace discrimination against lesbians, gays, bigender, and transgender individuals. Secondarily, we will talk about how to distinguish between personal feelings and the role of manager who must uphold the law. And then lastly, we'll talk about how important it is to judge individuals on relevant work-related criteria. All right, so there are some important definitions to start with. The first one is one that is largely biological, and this is the one that's written up in the Merriam-Webster Dictionary. The word sex defined as either of the two major forms of individuals that occur in many species and that are distinguished respectively as female or male, especially on the basis of their reproductive organs and structures. And again, this is a biological and anatomical definition. Sexual orientation is defined as whom one is attracted to for personal and intimate relationships. Gender is the behavioral, cultural, and psychological traits typically associated with one's sex. And then that of gender identity and that is around how one identifies for male or female purposes based on a combination of genetics and environment. With the definitions as our backdrop, let's go ahead and consider what the federal law actually says. And so the law says, and this is Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, and it basically says, it shall be unlawful employment practice for an employer to fail or refuse to hire or to discharge any individual or otherwise discriminate against any individual with respect to his compensation, terms, conditions, or privileges of employment because of such individuals. And it lists, right, the federal law lists several protected classes, one of which is that of sex. You will notice in that language that discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation is not included in Title VII. The law's intent really is on sex-based discrimination. Uh, which it interprets as involving the treatment of someone, an applicant or employee, unfavorably because of that person's sex. Now, as one might imagine, sex-based discrimination is not all that um, easy to determine. At the center of anti-discriminatory law is first the notion of sex being a biological um, definition. But it is very closely related to this idea of gender, which is around the social, psychological, and behavioral manifestations of what society has come or come to expect or challenge around, you know, what are expectations or norms for certain sex groups, for males and females. And this notion of gender identity, again, that is based on, you know, social, psychological, behavioral aspects that are regardless of your bio biological identification. And this has something to do with your inner, inner sense of being, right? And then the idea of sexual orientation is, is around um, a person's emotional, romantic, or sexual attraction to individuals of a particular gender, women or men. And so you can see that these terms have a lot of interplay and, and largely orbit each other and, and largely contextual in meaning. And of course, the courts have, have grappled with this because you know claims are brought to court around sex-based discrimination and it has sort of to untangle what is actually covered by the law and, and where anti-discriminatory or discriminatory practices um, have actually crossed the line. In order to understand, you know, sort of the complexity of this, let's discuss the Price Waterhouse Hopkins case. It illustrates how the terms sex and gender have a lot of interplay, a lot of overlap, and are largely synonymous. 
And in this case, Anne Hopkins was up for partnership. And however, she was neither offered nor denied partnership in Pricewaterhouse, which is an accounting firm. Her candidacy rolled over the next year. And when she was denied uh, her partnership, she then sued her company under Title VII based on sex uh, discrimination. And her argument was that she was denied partnership because the, she didn't fit the company's idea of what a female employee should look and act like. And so this, she's arguing that you know, this gender stereotyping is sex-based discrimination. And so it went through the district court and went to the appeals court and finally went up to the, the, the Supreme Court. And in there, the Supreme Court established that gender stereotyping is sex-based discrimination. And so, and then would be allowable under Title VII. Then it also established what's called a mixed motive framework that allows employees to prove discrimination when lawful reasons for letting go of an employee or making employment-based decisions um, occur alongside ones that are discriminatory, right? So in this case, uh, Pricewaterhouse had argued that Anne uh, did not necessarily get along well with others and at the same time, she, you know, did was too masculine, and so the court said that in order to avoid liability, the company had to prove that they would have made the decision, meaning an adverse employment decision, not give her the partnership, regardless of her sex. And if they were not able to prove that, then that is actionable under Title VII. Now let's consider a different scenario, and in this scenario. An applicant successfully goes through the interview process and is offered a job. And then later the employer learns that that prospective employee is gay and then rescinds, takes back the offer. The question is, is that legal? Under Title VII, purely from a federal standpoint, that would be considered not illegal, right? However, if it had were in Washington state, um, where there are anti-discriminatory laws around sexual orientation, or even at a locality like Seattle, where sexual orientation is a protected characteristic, uh, that would be considered illegal. So it kind of depends on where uh, the activity occurred, where the adverse employment decision occurred. In another scenario where uh, a gay man is sexually harassed by another gay man, a question might come up, is that covered under Title VII on sex-based discrimination and or harassment? And the answer is yes, because the law basically protects sexual harassment regardless of gender. And so it could be harassment uh, between opposite sex or same sex. Now, even though the federal law does not expressly cover sexual orientation, the EEOC has taken a position to in interpreting and enforcing Title VII's provision on sex discrimination as including gender identity or sexual orientation. And this is regardless of what, of what the state or local laws might be. And so how this might manifest itself is when an employee files a claim to the EOC and the EOC makes a determination, it sees it through this lens, right? But the employer may challenge that and say, well, the federal law does not actually cover that. And so then the courts would have to kind of figure that out, should it go through the legal system. Now, it's always important to understand where the claim may be occurring, right? So at the state level, there are over 40% of all states that now prohibit discrimination based on sexual orientation, gender identity, or both. So uh, this is an ongoing development. Uh, in the nation, and it'll be important to understand what may be occurring here so that employers are mindful of how they can be held liable. Here is a map of the states that are currently have non-discrimination laws that cover sexual orientation and gender identity, or just sexual orientation. And so you can see a Washington state um, has employment non-discrimination law that covers both sexual orientation and gender identity right and then there are those that are lighter green that covers um, only sexual orientation though there might be some protection uh, through the federal law it's important to understand that 
the jurisdiction itself will have some say as to the legitimacy of the claims. As stated earlier, Washington state is one of the states that makes it illegal to discriminate based on sexual orientation or gender identity. And you'll see here a, a link that the state has provided as a checklist to make sure employers are compliant. So you can pause the video and note this for yourself so that you can look, take a look at what this che checklist looks like to make sure that you're aware of what is expected of an employer. From a liability perspective, it's of course important to be aware of laws, whether they be federal, state, and local, in order to avoid possible expensive liability. Now, even if the law does not outright protect certain groups, it's, it's really good to consider how the market can react, particularly because we have an open market system here in the United States. Now, let's consider a case where a company exercised its right to have a position and how the market reacted. So in 1991, Crackle Barrel, which is an American chain of restaurants and gift stores with a southern country theme, announced that it would no longer employ non-heterosexual people. It then dismissed its gay and lesbian employees. Now, it was met with great opposition. There were pickets and protests. And the LGBT community then bought stock, uh, company stock, so that it could pressure the board of directors to change its policies. Cracker Barrel faced a lot of negative uh, customer reaction, and, uh, and it was sustained for quite a bit of time. Under sustained market pressure, by 2002, Cracker Barrel uh, and its board of directors voted to include gays and lesbians in its anti-discriminatory policies. It responded to the market pressure to be a more inclusive company. The Cracker Barrel situation and ones like it serve as cautionary tales of how an employer can make policies uh, because he has a right to do so. Um, however, the market can respond very quickly or effectively, ultimately, in pressuring the company to take a very different position from its original position. From a management standpoint, the safest approach really is to judge the employees on relevant work-related criteria and nothing else. This will help distinguish between personal feelings and management best practices and so that employers can ultimately avoid very costly legal processes or even market responses. So it's, it's good to just make sure that decisions are based on qualifications and the fitness of the employee to do the job. All right, so that brings us to the end of this learning session. I hope you walked away with some definitions and how those definitions interplay, what the federal law allows, as well as how it is enforced and how the laws can also differ at the local and the state level, and how it's important to understand that regardless of what the law actually allows, the market may have a very different response than what the employer has rights to. So the employer may have rights, but then the market may also respond differently. And so it would be fairly important to consider being able to distinguish between one's personal feelings as well as what uh, is allowed by the law or is supported by the market, right? And then in order to avoid costly liability or even just costly market reactions. So thank you very much for watching. Uh, should you need my help on those uh, in your assignments, uh, please do reach out to me. Uh, that information is in the syllabus and I am happy to help. Thank you for watching.